I'm Bill Witherspoon, and I'm one of the authors of Roadside Geology of Georgia. And I'm showing you a program that I first uh, put together uh, by when I was taking a class in paleoclimatology, study of ancient climates, at Georgia Tech in 2017. The climate change is an enduring part of Earth's history, and um, Georgia's rocks and landscapes reveal its history of climate. And the majority of Georgia's mineral deposits have something to do with climate. So to begin with, we need to know the regions of Georgia, the southern half of the state, the coastal plain, which is made up of loose sediments, not very much rock, that accumulated beside the present Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and at times the shorelines were all the way in as, as close in to, as Columbus and Macon. So sea level has gone up and down and the land has also gone up and down over time. The northwest corner of the state, the Appalachian Plateau and Valley and Ridge, are an area that have uh, sedimentary rocks that faced an ancient ocean that's now gone uh, and uh, it's actually all the rocks in it are older than the first dinosaur and the reason that ancient ocean is now gone is that it closed shut it slammed slammed shut uh, in uh, the time that Africa and North America collided and that all the continents came together to make Pangaea and the rocks in between, the Blue Ridge and Piedmont, are rocks that began as sedimentary rocks and some volcanic rocks. But they, as they got slammed in the north, they got shoved deep underground and they turned into, uh, by heat and pressure, what we call metamorphic rocks. Some of them got hot and melted and turned into magma and cooled off as igneous rocks like Stone Mountain of today. And to think about what we can read about the climate history of Georgia, we from the rocks. We need to realize that most of the information is contained in those sediments and sedimentary rocks. So we have a window on 0 to 95 million years ago in those younger sediments of the coastal plain. And we have another window into 550 to 315 million years ago in those sedimentary rocks of northwest Georgia. And even though the, the rock history of the Blue Ridge and Piedmont spans a much longer range of time, um, it's not as much that we can read about the climate history from those areas. So we'll be mostly focusing on the 0 to 95 and the 315 to 550 million time intervals. So we think about what gl drives climate change. There are several factors. Um, the changes in the heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, the movement of tectonic plates, volcanic eruptions, asteroid impacts, and changes in the geometry of the Earth and the Sun. And all these drive climate change at various time scales. So the basic thing to know is that without any heat trapping gases in the atmosphere, Earth would hardly be habitable. The average temperature would be well below freezing, about around zero degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but Earth does have heat trapping gases and they play a role in the thermostat of the Earth. The Earth basically has a thermostat and the most important gas in that thermostat is carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide is coming out of the Earth all the time as volcanoes erupt and it's also being exchanged uh, in between the oceans and the atmosphere at all the time. But for the thermostat to work, we have the uh, effect of weathering is very important in the system. Silicate rocks, as they weather, uh, they pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. When the, when, the, uh, um, when the Earth gets too warm, the weathering will extract the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and cool things off. Uh, but if things get too cold, then eventually the amount of, of gas coming out of the volcanoes will warm things back up. So Earth has stayed in a habitable range of temperature. So um, let's focus on the movement of tectonic plates and the, and the volcanic eruptions. Those two, as you, if you've heard about plate tectonics, you probably know that volcanic eruptions are related to them. And of course, uh, also they're related to uh, tectonic plates are pretty well shown by where the earthquakes, the major earthquakes are on the planet. So 
you can really see uh, just with this map of showing the, the earthquakes over time, um, we can see where the plate boundaries are. So we have these plate boundaries in the ocean where plates are coming apart, such as down the middle of the Atlantic. And we also have uh, uh, plate boundaries like around the west coast of South America or the west side of the Pacific, uh, where one plate goes down, the ocean plate goes down underneath the, the adjacent plate. And, uh, and those are the other kind of plate boundaries that actually account for the ring of fire volcanoes around the Pacific. So when we want to think about where most of the volcanic activity on Earth is taking place at any given time, it actually has to do with the process in which a plate pulls apart and gives birth to an ocean. So uh, this is an area where you have uplift in the middle of a plate, you have the plates trying to pull apart. Uh, this could be the East African Rift Valley of today or actually the Basin and Range province of the western United States are both places where continents are trying to pull apart. And once they pull apart, you get a new ocean basin, kind of like the present day Red Sea. Uh, and over time, that ocean basin gets wider and wider. Uh, but most of the magma that's, that's happening, most of the volcanic eruptions that happen on the planet are happening under sea at where these plates are pulling apart. And that's where most of the CO2 from volcanoes is coming out continuously. So over time, all that, that uh, CO2 comes out as the plates um, pull apart. Now, so if you speed up this machine, which has happened over time in, in the geologic past, times when you have faster sea, sea floor spreading, the pulling apart of the oceans happens faster, you're generating more carbon dioxide. And um, so that presumably would cause warming of the planet. And uh, so uh, several years ago, uh, uh, a group of scientists put together some computer models uh, based on the way the thermostat works and knowing about how fast seafloor spreading takes place. And so, and we have really good information about the rates of seafloor spreading since Pangaea is because Pangaea split apart and we have a really good handle on how fast the plates were moving apart over that period of time. Um, and so what we're looking at here is a, a graph. The model is in the red line and the uh, band around it is the amount of uncertainty. So notice we have a pretty large uncertainty before Pangaea came together because we just don't know that much about how fast plates were moving apart at the time. Um, but, uh, but interestingly, even though the model is somewhat uncertain, we have evidence from what we call proxies. So information about uh, how much carbon dioxide was in the atmosphere based on geologic evidence. This includes like the stomata of leaves. Uh, leaves have uh, bigger stomata. If you've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, that's the, the um, pores that, that exchange oxygen that are underneath the leaves. And so you can look at fossil leaves and get that information. There's also stuff like uh, the uh, formation of calcium concretions in the soil, and that's, that's a, a proxy. So based on the proxies, we get the black line, and you notice that there's general agreement with the, the highs and lows. In particular, there's quite a low in the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, around 300 million years ago. And another thing this can be matched up to uh, is the history of glaciations. So we have, so this bottom graph is actually showing uh, to what paleo latitude the glaciers extended. So back around 300 million years ago, uh, glaciers extended all the way down to about uh, 35 degrees. Uh, in this case, it was south latitude um, because that's where the land masses were. Uh, for the ice to, to extend on, um, but uh, we got nearly that far in glaciation in our very most recent time as well. And you notice that those correspond to the two coldest times, or the two lowest CO2 times, rather, in the upper graph. So just looking at this, you can notice that uh, you know, we're right now, we're fairly concerned because we've now recently got above 400 parts per million carbon dioxide. But that's nowhere near as high as carbon dioxide has been in the Earth's past. So 
you might take some reassurance out of that, but we'll we'll talk about that. Uh, so so uh, we're we're down at a relatively low uh, level of carbon dioxide compared to what the planet has tolerated in the past. Okay, so. So driving climate change, we've already talked about plate tectonics in terms of volcanic eruptions. But there's also just, if you're going to look at a place like Georgia, you know, how does it move across the, the planet is going to drive the climate in any given place. So, and we're going to watch how Georgia moves across the planet, as we already did in that earlier animation. So first thing we want to know is like uh, how life zones correspond to the latitudes and the positions of continents. So in this one you notice that the deserts, for example the Sahara Desert and the Kalahari Desert, are uh, on uh, a lot of them face towards the west coast of continents. So you notice in Australia as well, the western coast, the Atacama Desert in, in, in Chile, western coast, uh, and at particular latitudes. So where you're on the uh, around 30 degrees north or south latitude and you're on the west coast of a continent, you tend to have deserts. And this can be explained by the uh, understanding ocean circulation and weather, weather patterns and so on. So now I've overlaid the 30 degree latitude lines on top of an animation of moving plates by Christopher Scotes that's part of the theory of plate tectonics package from TASA Graphics. And uh, so right now, look, looking 600 million years ago, MA's million years, and the continents are all clustered around the South Pole in a uh, landmass called Rodinia. And we're going to see Georgia emerge from this shortly as we start to do. I'll, I'll point it out to you. We've got Georgia uh, about uh, right in this area. And so about 540 million years ago, Georgia is around that 30 degrees latitude on the west coast of a continent. So you'd expect drier conditions then. And then subsequently, uh, Georgia is not so much, well, it's in the interior of a continent for a good long while of the huge continent, Pangaea. And once the Atlantic Ocean opens up, it's going to be on the east coast of the continent. So even when it goes through 30, which is not too far from where we're at now, um, it's on the east coast of the continent, so we don't get the desert conditions. So that's something we might expect to find in Georgia. Chris Scotes was responsible for the, for the uh, animation you saw already, but he's also done a lot more work on paleogeography, in the, and, it's, and it's available as this resource called Earth Viewer, and in some other places you can find it on the web as well. Um, and so I'm going to be showing you screenshots from Earth Viewer which uh, is funded by the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. It's got itself into all different kinds of areas of science, not just medicine. Um, and so just to just say what, what this is based on, it's the same, uh, the, the paleomagnetic compass needles that are frozen into rocks. That's the basic basis for understanding where the continents were, especially before Pangaea. Uh, plus the, the paleogeography is based on just a huge amount of interpretations of ancient sedimentary environments and mountain building episodes that geologists have been amassing over the last couple of hundred years of studying rocks. Um, so indeed 480 million years ago Georgia is sitting right at 30 degrees south latitude and what kind of rock do we have? Well all the way up and down from New York to Texas which is not that much difference in latitude though as you notice at that time, um, the, uh, we have this deposit of, of Dola stone, which is a um, calcium magnesium carbonate rock. Dola stone is something that tends to form when you have shallow seas and area where evaporation is making the seawater more saline than normal. And so, uh, you know, what we'd expect under desert conditions. And today, um, well, the, uh, this Dola stone has almost no fossils in it, and so to some extent this conversion of lime sediments to dolomite is, destroys fossils. Um, and so it could, it could be somewhat that why this Knox group gold Dola stone, which you find around northwest Georgia, not too far from Barry College campus, um, the, um, 
Knox group dolostone uh, is almost bare of fossils, um, but uh, you do find in some places you find these fossils called stromatolites, which are fossilized cyanobacteria. And today you can really only find those in hypersaline waters, uh, such as the Shark Bay in Australia. So, so this is an indication that the, the salinity was hostile to most, most living things. Um, so climate, uh, just the, making the connection with mineral deposits. Well, actually, this, this uh, dola stone is a, is a mineral deposit in itself. It's used for a lot of crushed stone for making cement and so on. So as the world's ocean was, was putting away all this dola stone and limestone at this time, the, the planet cooled. That's the way our thermostat works. That's the way we'd expect it to work. But it was still relatively warm at this particular time. Uh, and so it, it has been puzzling uh, in, to, to notice that there was a glaciation when the planet had, you know, carbon dioxide levels somewhere in the, you know, 3,000 parts per million range. So, uh, you know, eight times what it is now, something like that. But there may have something to do with the fact that this, the, this big southern continent, the one we were not on, the, the, most of the rest of the continents, were still clustered around the South Pole. Um, and there were some mountain building episodes that put the uh, southern continents up into high elevation. And so that could cause some uh, ice to start forming there. And then you get sort of a self-reinforcing effect or something like that. Uh, so there may be ways to explain why the South Pole was so glaciated at this time. Um, and so um, at the end of the, the Ordovician period, beginning of the Silurian period, um, we're, we're still, we've still got this glaciation going on, and we've got a connection to the uh, iron ore forming uh, in a belt that runs all the way from uh, New York down to Alabama. The city of Birmingham, Alabama, was built because of the iron ore deposits, named after Birmingham, England, for that reason. Um, and so some of that is found in Georgia. So I'm going to show you, this is a location in Georgia, uh, where, uh, Tim Chowns is at West Georgia, uh, University, uh, Professor Emeritus now. Um, and, uh, he, uh, accompanied me on a trip to some, uh, tunnels that are, were, uh, produced to mine and, and extract iron ore up in, uh, uh, just a little bit west of Lafayette, Georgia, so northwest Georgia. And so this picture, the lower picture, shows the seam of, of uh, iron ore that's down at the hematite that's down at the bottom of one of these tunnels. Um, and he's standing out there near the opening to the tunnel. Well, uh, back uh, so a long time ago, uh, Tim Chowns was showing that the relationship between the iron ore has to happen related to sea level rise coming in and flooding uh, older carbonate material that's out on the, the that uh, originally shells that were deposited originally closer to shore and then when the sea level rose uh, these were flooded in deep water so there's the iron there's the deep water uh, where the blue lines closer to the right is when the water was deeper um, and so and sea level was bouncing up and down in this period, again, because of that glaciation at the South Pole. So now we're moving into the time of um, uh, 320 million years ago, and the continents have come together. We've, uh, continents have collided to make Pangaea. And I'm showing you Georgia in the same uh, relative position it was in the last slide, but now I'm going to rotate the globe a little bit, uh, a good bit, <laughs> and, uh, and show you that uh, Georgia and that mountain range kind of straddles the equator. Okay, Georgia's a little bit south of the equator, uh, and um, and north of that mountain range, or west, if, if in present geography, northwest of the mountain range, um, you had this shallow sea covering North America, but the mountain, the the uh, uh, rivers coming down out of the mountain range dumped. Uh, lots of sediment, and, and there was kind of this swampy area. And the swampy area in, uh, along the mountain range is a place where a lot of trees 
which were relatively new in evolution, uh, fell into the swamps. And so we see, find these fossils, and this is how the coal formed. So, um, so in, in Georgia, you're going to find these atop Lookout Mountain and, and Sand Mountain. Uh, and you can actually see where people have mined coal and they've left piles of shale that have plant fossils like this. But out towards Illinois, you can actually see also cycles of relative sea rise and fall, which have been called for a long time cyclothems, uh, sort of a cyclic rise and fall of sea level. And again, those have been tied to the orbital cycles related to glaciation. So we're going to talk about the coastal plain. And this was a time when, again, as you remember, uh, faster seafloor spreading drives more carbon dioxide, warmer temperatures, but also the faster seafloor spreading, um, then uh, you have this relatively hot seafloor. And hot seafloor means it doesn't sink down as far on the planet. And uh, because it's less dense. And that means that the, the water tends to uh, spill out onto the land more. And so we have this relatively, this really high standing sea level, both no ice at the poles because there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere and more water pushed up onto the continents because the, the seafloor is, is spreading rapidly. Uh, and there was one more effect in, in the western part of the United States, which was that the Rocky Mountains were rising up and kind of loading the countryside in front of them, pushing it down, and that caused the sea wave that separated eastern and western North America. So they actually had two different populations of dinosaurs because uh, there, there was water in between them. And <clears throat> so the oldest exposed strata on Georgia's coastal plain is of this age. Um, so the dinosaurs were finished off when this asteroid struck at the area of Yucatan, and by that time the seas had retreated somewhat. Um, and there are places that are just west of Georgia, over in Alabama and on into Texas, that you can find actual deposits from the tsunami that was caused by the asteroid impact. Um, so this produced the uh, second uh, largest mass extinction, which had also been somewhat set up by the fact that a lot of massive volcanism had already been happening in India, a lot of spilling out of what they call the Deccan traps. So, um, so, but we had we had a, a, a large mass extinction that happened, um, and this wiped out all the non-avian dinosaurs. So of course, the birds are the dinosaurs that survived. You may have heard that. Uh, it wiped out whole groups of marine reptiles, and uh, it right, wiped out the squid relatives called ammonites that had the little coiled shells, and a whole lot of other things. And so let's look at how, how asteroid impacts can cl drive climate change. So this is an illustration from an excellent resource called Earth's Climate. And, and in the first few minutes, the uh, vaporization of water uh, and rock when the asteroid strikes uh, just changed the atmosphere dramatically. And so you get soot over, over days and years. Um, you get uh, soot and dust into the atmosphere. And so you basically block out the sun, kill off a lot of the plant life. And at the same time, the all of the stuff that went in the atmosphere is causing acidification of lakes and the ocean. So, so uh, over days to years, you've got this hard impact. But then the longer uh, term impact over decades to centuries is that you get a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So you first get warming, then cooling, and then when the soot and dust falls out of the stratosphere, uh, you get warming again uh, because a lot of the in the case of the Yucatan impact, a lot of the rock that was vaporized was uh, limestone. So you're freeing all the carbon, carbon dioxide in that limestone. And the firestorms, forest burning, that puts CO2 to the atmosphere. So in Georgia, you can see the boundary uh, position. However, there was erosion going on at this particular location at the particular time of impact. So we don't have those tsunami deposits preserved. But you can get fairly close. And you can walk down the trail into Providence Canyon and, uh, and stand uh, in the younger sediments and look back on the older ones, and poof, there goes a dinosaur. 
So since the time, extinction of the dinosaurs, we can actually go into the oceans and we bring out a uh, little foraminifera, a little uh, micros uh, microscopic single-celled um, organisms uh, that, that made their skeletons out of calcium carbonate. And you can look at the oxygen isotopes in that. And it reflects what the composition of the seawater was. And this is a good indicator of temperature. The main thing that can affect that is how much uh, water has been bound up in ice. Uh, it has to do with precipitation, uh, kind of sorting out the heavier oxygen isotopes from the lighter ones. And so if there's ice on the planet, that's one of the factors. But if there's no ice on the planet, then you've got a really good indicator of temperature. And what we're seeing is that the temperature at the bottom of the ocean, where it's now nearly froze, freezing, got up as high as 12 degrees Celsius. That's like, well, 10 degrees Celsius is 50 degrees Fahrenheit. So, so things got pretty warm at the bottom of the ocean. Um, at 55 million years ago, this is the same time at, at seas or up over Florida and South Georgia. And... So we know that the, the polar ice caps were non-existent. In fact, in the Arctic, you can find alligator fossils. So, um, and there was this enormous spike that, that lasted about 200,000 years. So it was, it was a spike that was similar in its suddenness, not quite as sudden, but, but similar in the spike in carbon dioxide that's, that's, uh, that's happening now due to burning fossil fuels called the late Paleocene thermal maximum. Um, and we have several possible causes of this of the spike that are not necessarily mutually exclusive. So uh, an idea that uh, uh, methane hydrates from the, from the seabed could have been re released, uh, the idea of oxygenation of, of uh, organic matter on an exposed shelf, uh, and as the northernmost Atlantic was beginning to open at this time, there uh, could have been mantle magma that was injected into carbon-rich sedimentary rocks. Uh, and one more th thought is the thawing of permafrost. So we've had, we, we don't really know exactly what caused this spike. Um, but we do know that, that it, we had a very warm period of time, and so we have uh, limestone that formed, uh, you know, there was a lot of, of, of uh, a weathering happening because the thermostat warmed up. So the weathering that happened caused limestone to be deposited in the oceans. So our thermostat was working. Uh, limestone was put away to cool things off. And this Eocene age limestone is actually what uh, contains the water of the state of Florida, the Florida aquifer, uh, which is also exposed in Georgia. Actually, this is a spring the largest spring in Georgia is in this Eocene age limestone, the Florida aquifer. So the limestone then successfully was cooling the planet off. And uh, by the time this was cooling off, we had these deposits of kaolin in Georgia. That's Georgia's leading mineral product. This is a white clay that's a weathering product of granite. And uh, so during that really very warm tropical period, we could have weathered uh, the uh, the granite of, of Georgia quite deeply. So, um, and the, the, the pink areas on the cover of Roadside Geology of Georgia, these are the large granites. And where these large granite bodies were weathering, just to the south of them, we have this kaolin belt in Georgia. So we think the deep weathering took place when things were very warm. The kaolin was deposited as things were cooling off a bit. Okay, and so let's move on to the um, uh, time that after glaciation starts. So limestone effectively, you know, we're, we're, the thermostat's working, we're cooling the planet off, and it actually cooled off uh, enough that we started to get glaciations again. And once we have ice on the planet, then the oxygen isotope record is telling us both about temperature and about the volume of ice on the planet. And it actually allows us, by, by tracking that, then when we're looking at the most recent period of time uh, in the ice ages, we can actually, the bouncing up and down of this ice, oxygen isotope record 
can tell us about when glaciers were coming and going uh, in, in the most recent geologic time. And, uh, and that turns out to relate, believe it or not, to the changes in the orbital cycles of the Earth and the Sun. So changes in Earth-Sun geometry. Um, and so we have to look at that to understand how the, why the ice ages came and went uh, in the most recent two million years or so of geologic history. So, so generally things were getting cooler. We think a lot of that had to do with the fact that that were so successful in forming these carbonate rocks and driving the thermostat that down uh, cooler. Um, but um, uh, now we're down to this position where we can actually be affected by the Earth-Sun geometry. The uh, Earth is, it has this elliptical orbit around the Sun, and it's, it's sometimes the elliptical orbit is such that, that uh, the summers are coolest because June, the middle of the summer in the northern hemisphere, uh, is farther away from the sun. So, and during those periods of time, you're going to get snow remaining to form ice more where you've got snow. And why is this important? Well, we have up in northern Canada, for example, boundaries between the, uh, the or for that matter, northern Europe, boundaries between the land and the Arctic Ocean. And if the snow is melting every summer, then you don't get an ice sheet. But if you slightly change the orbital parameters and some snow starts to last, it piles up. And you notice this, this line, the snow melting line, goes up with elevation. So as you pile up more ice, you get this self-reinforcing mechanism because the ice piled up uh, at higher elevation is more likely to last. And the higher the elevation of the ice, the more it lasts. So you get this self-reinforcing effect until we get ice that came down all the way to present location of the Ohio and Missouri rivers, which is not a coincidence. The depression of the, the weight of the glacier on the landscape caused these to be low places that all the water drained into. Um, and uh, so we, we uh, uh, Georgia's climate was affected at this time as well. Uh, and because of this proximity of this continental glacier, we had seasonally drier weather in the southeast and cooler, of course. And so we think that, that we have these high elevation boulder fields in the southeast that were also that were where we might have had permafrost in the higher elevations, even in Georgia. Uh, and the rock tend to break up and form these boulder fields that you could find in, in the Georgia mountains. At the same time, with, with sea level bouncing up and down, uh, whenever sea level was high, then you had a shoreline that formed in Georgia. And uh, when sea level was highest, the shorelines were farthest inland. And, and so we have uh, uh, shorelines like uh, Trail Ridge, which reinforces the Okefenokee Swamp, is the oldest of these shorelines. But we have uh, some dates, a little bit uh, loose uh, dating on the, on the other shorelines, but you can see uh, in thousands of years the different shorelines of Georgia have different dates. And today on the shorelines of Georgia, uh, as in the past, uh, you, you find these streaks of black. These are heavy mineral sands, and uh, this is the stuff that uh, sand that comes out of the Piedmont has some of the heavy minerals that are titanium rich or what have you. Um, and this is a mineral deposit, not so much on our present beaches as in some of these ancient beaches. So here's one of the ancient beaches. And I was on a, um, a field trip with a group of geologists, the 50th anniversary field trip of the Georgia Geological Society, titled Rising Sea Level on the Georgia Coast. So now we're down to talking about, uh, we're getting it down to today's climate and tomorrow's climate. And so I'm going to tell you that we have a problem. I don't think that's a secret to many of you, although there's still some people out there that, that uh, uh, politicians that want to look the other way and, and not consider the science. There is also a solution that, that uh, does not involve huge amounts of regulation, 
that uh, is, is much closer to a free market solution that certainly large numbers of Republicans, not their current legislators necessarily in Congress, but but uh, it's a pro it's a it's a there is a solution that that uh, uh, we can we'll get into just briefly. So let's go back to the science. So this is a uh, diagram that was made in 1999 uh, by looking at all kinds of of weather information that had been collected historically, plus information from tree rings, corals, ice cores. In general, the temperatures were decreasing gradually over uh, until about uh, about 1900, and then they have elevated quite rapidly. Well, this was published in 1999, and uh, and uh, there, there was just a fierce reaction that said. Uh, there's got to be something wrong with this. We don't want to see this. We don't believe that, you know, we're doing this. Um, and so lots and lots of other studies were done. And so, uh, so when you put them all together, you essentially got the same effect. So uh, it, it, it is, it's science that has been validated. Um, but one other thing that's done is that we have these models that can model climate based on the physics of the atmosphere uh, and based on uh, understanding how much CO2 is in the atmosphere and how much uh, particles are in the atmosphere of, of, uh, that, that can block out the sun. And, uh, and so there are models that, that can more or less replicate this graph uh, just by doing the physics. And, of course, the big thing that, that's going to cool the planet are these volcanic eruptions. So we've got those uh, in, in, are part of the model. Uh, there's also somewhat the changes in how much uh, energy the sun's putting out, and we, then we put other things into the model. And so when those things are put into the model, we get uh, results that look very much like this hockey stick. But we only get the hockey stick if we do put the CO2 in the atmosphere into the model. So the rising CO2 in the atmosphere drives the uh, upsurge in the hockey stick at the right. If you don't put the CO2 into the atmosphere, it shows a cooling pattern that we would still be getting cooler if it weren't for the CO2. So this is essentially what you might call a smoking gun. This tells us that the CO2 in the atmosphere is driving the warming, the temperature that has been validated by science. Um, and so that, that same uh, curve that shows the rising uh, CO2 and the rising temperatures uh, is, is a fairly familiar illustration that, that you may have seen before um, that shows that the black line is the carbon dioxide concentration going up, and today we're up actually above that, above 400. We had this uh, exercise to do in the paleoclimatology class I took at Georgia Tech. And uh, it was to use this MATLAB software to simulate putting the carbon dioxide into the atmosphere and then see how Earth's thermostat fixes that. So if you spike the, uh, the 1,000 gigatons up into the atmosphere, in other words, if we don't put any restraint on burning fossil fuels, then you get up to... 2.7 times pre-industrial levels, which is way beyond what the Paris Climate Accords would like us to get to, et cetera. So, um, so how does the thermostat work on that? Well, after about 100,000 year, years, it gets back down to 1.6 uh, times pre-industrial. Return to today's level after 150,000 years. This is another way of looking at the same information, is just to look at the number of days above 100 degrees Fahrenheit as recorded uh, on the United States map. And we can also already see changes in this map going up to 2010, which was when I first started showing this, I guess. Um, and But if we project that into the future, um, this is where we've gotten by 2020. Um, and now you're going to start to see a difference because on the left side, we're doing something about lowering emissions. On the right side, we're just full speed ahead. And we look at what the full speed ahead scenario looks like. And 
it looks increasingly less tolerable. So within the lifetime of college students today, let's say, uh, you know, when we get out to 2090, it, it starts to look pretty different in terms of the number of, uh, you know, Atlanta looks more like uh, Arizona does at present <laughs> in terms of the number of 100 degree days. And of course, it'll be a lot more humid here than it is out there. We're not saying that this, this bad picture is set in stone. Uh, it really depends on how quickly we get a price on carbon pollution. And so um, there are conservatives, there are Republicans, not the ones in Congress because they are afraid of getting sorted out in the primaries if, if they, if they uh, lean too far this way. But uh, here are a couple of Republican former uh, secretaries of state and treasury who, who uh, in 2017, uh, headed up a group that, that made a case for putting a price on carbon as you collect the money from the fossil fuel companies and it will make your energy costs go up, but you'll get a dividend back. And as it turns out, uh, people who are of lower and middle income tend to get more back in dividend than they pay out in extra energy costs. So, so when I showed that, that slide at uh, Young Harris College uh, to a group that was across, across the political spectrum, uh, I, I got a person who, was, who had moved there from California jumping on me and saying I shouldn't really use this slide because these guys, uh, Schultz and Baker, represent cor corporate America. They've been on the boards of lots of big companies and they're, you know, this, this, is not, this is not good to listen to corporate America. And, and, uh, and then I, in the evaluations, I got criticisms from people on the right saying, oh, this is political, you shouldn't be political. And so to the people on the left, I say that if it's not bipartisan, if it doesn't have support from conservatives, it's not going to last. It has to stay, have staying power. Even in the present configuration of Congress, something, could get, something else could get passed. But if it, if it is horrible for, for uh, the business establishment for corporate America, then, uh, you know, because of regulations, what have you, then it's not going to last the next change of, of uh, political power. And to the people on the right, I say, this isn't political. This is survival. <laughs> this is this is our future. And and these uh, listen to your seniors. Uh, George Schultz recently passed away, but but um, th these older Republicans are worth a fair hearing. They've gone out to recruit student groups on this, and there are now uh, Republican and conservative groups of students that that uh, all these university Republican clubs that are that are on board with this same approach. Now, I'm actually uh, a volunteer with another organization called Citizens Climate Lobby that has been pushing essentially the same approach for about 10 years before this other this uh, Schultz Baker plan came out. Uh, carbon fee and dividend, same same thing. Keep lobbying for this carbon fee and dividend. And uh, and one of the things that we did in the previous before 2018 Congress was get uh, equal numbers of of uh, Democrats and Republicans to sign on and join a caucus that talked about climate. Uh, and so this was something that was working through 2018. But after the 2018 election, a lot of the Republicans who were on it lost their seat. In the last Congress, we got uh, a large number of uh, co-sponsors for this act, and we're still pushing it today. So, climate change, enduring part of Earth's history, changing climate is etched into Georgia's rocks and landscapes. Climate has influenced the majority of Georgia's mineral deposits. And in terms of the future climates, things were actually would be cooling off. We have a cooling trend. We had a cooling trend going, going and about 100,000 years from now, we would have, we would hit another glaciation according to the cycles of, of the sun. But that's just being interrupted with our spike in, in temperatures that humans have been adding. And how high that spike goes depends on how quickly effective action is taken. And so I always need to acknowledge that I'm the second author of Roadside Geology of Georgia. The first author is Pamela Gore at Georgia Perimeter College. And this is how you can connect to the book. So thank you and uh, be happy to get any questions.